was doing my doctoral research on the evolution of migration in Orioles. So um, that was the Baltimore Oriole and 35 or 40 different species and subspecies of Oriole. And to look at the evolutionary relationships between those different Orioles, one uses DNA and phylogenetic analysis tools. So you get DNA from a whole bunch of different bird species and subspecies that are alive today. And then you look at the differences and similarities between the DNA and you can construct a family tree that goes into the past. So what was a common ancestor of these two? Which ones are more closely related? When you have that tree, then you can also put time on it. Oh, it looks like these species diverged during the last glacial maximum. Maybe the glaciers came between them and split their territories. And so when I was asking why does the Baltimore Oriole migrate all the way from uh, very far north on the east coast of North America uh, to breed down to Central and South America and the Caribbean for the winter, and most other Orioles just prudently stay in the nice warm climate in the South. So I wanted to answer the question, I needed to use phylogenetic methods. And so that was my introduction, because phylogenetics, molecular phylogenetics, is all about gathering the DNA data and analyzing it to see what you can figure about about the history of the organism. Before we had uh, the ability to do phylogenetic analysis with DNA, people would look at things like morphology. We would look at animals and say, well, these are different from these others in this morphological character, the shape of a beak, the color of the feathers, things like that. And sometimes those things change very rapidly, and a lot of differences doesn't really mean that there's a huge evolutionary difference. So it's not a good way to accurately tell how long ago species diverged or which ones are really the most closely related. Particularly now that we're looking at large groups of data, because of things like next generation sequencing, the ability to get a whole genome, things like that, it's impossible to do much with this gigantic volume of data unless you use computer tools to sift through to find the meaningful things, the things in common, the patterns, and so on. And so as we understand more and more that it's all about complex systems in molecular biology. And it's not just this gene does this, but oh, here's a network of genes, and if one of them has something wrong, then other genes could compensate, so we need to understand the whole network. To be able to put all that information together takes massive computing power that a human brain really can't handle. For me, in particular, the ability to analyze genomes, and if not genomes, then individual genes between a large number of organisms. So I rely on phylogenetic tree building software, and also Bayesian analysis software, and also coalescent analysis software to be able to look at these data in multiple different ways and see whether I get a robust and well-supported history of these organisms. The biggest one is the fact that it's getting easier and easier to sequence whole genomes. And right now, uh, a major blockage in the pipeline for those of us doing evolutionary analysis is that very few computers really have the capacity to do large numbers of samples and whole genomes. You could do a large number of samples with a few thousand bases, or you could do a few samples with whole genomes. But the huge data crunch of large samples and whole genomes, I think the next step is going to be being able to crunch those gigantic vol volumes of data on normal computers, on people's laptops and desktops and things like that.
Because probably the emerging thing in healthcare is personalized medicine. We're understanding more and more that one size does not fit all, and that people need treatments that are geared towards their own genotype. And so as it becomes easier to look at whole genomes, first of all, you'll be able to look at people and understand more and more about them and their needs. But second of all, you need to be able to analyze it all. And it's got to be able to be done locally at the doctor's office, ultimately. That'll be the best care. So to be able to analyze a person's genome and relate it to other people with similar conditions and decide the best course of treatment is going to require the ubiquitous use of bioinformatics treatments. That's in addition to the fact that globally we are looking at things like genetic modification of crops and long-term consequences of introducing a crop that becomes almost the only crop that's out there if it, if it takes off. And so we need to be able to look at interactions between multiple genes to be able to understand those things as well. And then finally, I would say really big would be in cancer biology because cancer isn't a single event. Cancer is putting together a whole sequence of different events. And you have multiple opportunities to stop the cancer at each of those steps, but you need to understand which genetic um, occurrences occur when and how you can attack them. And so bioinformatics will be useful for that as well.